honored to be before these panelists. So without further ado, let me introduce who's sitting alongside me today. We are speaking to Ajay Bonga, who is the CEO of MasterCard, of course. Dr. Chen Demi, who is the former Minister of Commerce for the People's Republic of China and currently president of the China Association of Enterprises with Foreign Investment. We're also joined by Kieran Mazumdar Shah, who is the executive chairperson of Biocon. And finally, Jean Pascal Tricois, who joins us as CEO of Schneider Electric. Thank you all for your time. And what a fitting panel we have to discuss the topic, which of course is looking at the big reboot. So global trade and business in the face of pandemics. And I just wanna invite each of our panelists to give us their view of where we are in this reboot, taking into consideration everything from the disruption you've seen to supply chains, to business demand, but also having to combat some of the geopolitical headwinds that have already been laid out here and the threat of decoupling we're now facing from the US and China. So to kick things off, why don't we start with you, sir, Ajay Bongo, please kick things off for us. Thank you, thank you, Nancy. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of us together. Look, I think this whole crisis has disrupted lives, has disrupted livelihoods, but I think it's also forcing each of us to examine what we call business as usual. Because I think the reason is that a lot of the challenges and trends that were underlying in our economy for some time have got exacerbated during this crisis. So for example, access to the digital economy is quickly kind of becoming a dividing line between uh, what countries and businesses will be able to get through this with minimal damage or in fact may benefit and others that may find it very challenging to recover in the way we were pre-crisis. And the second really angle here is the fact that this physical distancing that we've been forced to go through for the sake of containing the virus, I think it's actually a put an accelerator under nationalist tendencies and at the mm -hmm. expense of efficiencies and resiliencies that come with partnerships and trade relationships. So I think those two angles uh, what we should be talking about as we go along. But uh, my view is that uh, these two, the first one, the one about digital, it's gone from nice to have to a necessity, which means we've got to think about two things. One is yeah, how are SMEs and people who may get left out, who may be challenged by this move, how do we get them to get a level playing field so they can play the way they need to because they're key to our future. And you can't have the internet of everything without the inclusion of everyone. You know what I mean? That's the that's the yeah. first challenge. And the second one is that I think uh, data, privacy, cybersecurity, this is just a hugely critical issue as we go more and more digital. And I think the challenge here is that on the other hand of this, everybody is going more local and more nationalistic. And I think if you have localization tendencies that prevent the transfer of data that impose technical standards that preclude competition or they promote a local monopoly. I don't think that's the way we're gonna get ourselves back on a pathway of growth. So you're okay. sitting in an island, the island kind of gets the fact that being connected is the most important way to be. And I think if we can all have a point where collaboration is the expectation, not the exception, then we'd get to a good mm -hmm. place for the reboot. That's what I'd say. Okay, thank you. So it seems that you're laying out some key challenges, but also some opportunities as we move yes. on to the next stage of the pandemic and perhaps looking to the next crisis. So Dr. Chen I mean, if you could just pick up there and elaborate on what you think the priorities should be in this reboot. Thank you, Nancy. 至今已经造成财政也入不敷出
，也考验我们各国能不能守望相助。当然，疫情也使世界贸易的医药卫生用品的销量大幅度的提升，使在线的网上的商业活动急剧的扩张。我们的好消息是，这个人体试验。这个疫苗已经开始有了，像阿斯利康、辉瑞和中国的疫苗已经进入了第三期。我们的坏消息是，嗯，这个病毒可能和呃非典、和中东呼吸综合症、和 H1N1 的大型的流感都一样，将会长期相伴着人们。所以我们认为，也许这个病到了后疫情时期也不远了。那么到后疫情时期的时候呢？全球化经济走向其实取决于各国，尤其是取决于大国的选择。因为未来二三十年，人类将进入了数字化的智能社会，全球价值链会发生变化，比如说更加短链化、区域化，但不会停止。所以政府呢，应该回归正常的公共管理，应该共同协商，重构国际的多变的规则，让企业能够在贸易和投资的便利化中间的公平的竞争，如果政府不能就多边机构的改革达成共识，那么世界将长期的处于一个无序化的状态。这样做对谁都不利的，因为科技还是要进步的，生产力还是要发展的。如果谁违背了规律呢，就等于搬起石头砸了自己的脚。谢谢，老师。Thank you, Dr. Chen. And perhaps let's go to Jean Pascal next. And Jean Pascal, I know Schneider Electric does an enormous amount of business in China. So perhaps picking up on some of those things Dr. Chen just talked about, and also your own view to what is taking place in this current environment. Well, we, uh, for the first, uh, it's great to be uh, to be with you all tonight. A uh, lot has been already said. We do business everywhere in the world, and on what strikes me is that the COVID has not really. Been provoking something, but it has been a magnifier or an accelerator of things that were already in operation. So, as I mentioned it, but the fragmentation of the world, which had started before, has been reinforced by the fact we can't travel and borders are closed. Um, I put on that the accentuation of inequalities, uh, unfortunately, because the weakest in our societies have been hit harder by uh, by the COVID. On, on big thing, which is of course very central to what Schneider does, a reinforcement of the awareness for sustainability, because in the mind of many people, the virus on climate change have the same source of density of population, urbanization, uh, globalization. One thing, frankly, that we've seen on, on all of us have spoken about it, it's digital is a big winner of the COVID because we could keep mm. going where we were digitized, like we do tonight uh, with that Zoom conference, we can still meet because that works. So my, my obsession at the moment or where we are focused is really about the rebuilding, the reboot. There is a, an astonishing amount of money uh, which is put on the table by government to step up to the, yeah. to the table. But let's make sure that the future that we are investing in is future-proof. And, and for me, the reboot would, would be, should be sustainable um, on I, when I say sustainable, leveraging completely technology and especially digital, uh, Ajay was speaking about the Internet of Things, so it should be smart and green, smart and green building, smart and green manufacturing, mm -hmm. smart nation, green nation, all of that going together. I think it should be open. Uh, we should be all striving to keep the markets open. Of course, there is more tension at the level of the G2, but the rest of us will really uh, must work together uh, to make sure that we adopt common standards, that we keep open trade, that we find common solution, that we reopen travel bubble. I'm also uh, worried by the fact that we can't travel these days. Yeah. I think the reboot must be fair and address the fate of the people who are the most marginalized or, or victims of this, the youth, which has been left out of school for some months, and the youth, which is coming on the job market in a time of crisis, and we need to be taking them in the company, even if there is a time of crisis. SMEs, we spoke about it uh, just before, on the underprivileged. Um, if there is one thing, frankly, that we have learned also is that the places where there was 
a fluid communication between companies, communities, government, where there was local empowerment inclusion have reacted much better and have recovered much faster than, uh, than the other ones. And we've seen that everywhere. Um, and, and I think it's a lesson for the future. Uh, we took decision together much faster. We've been much more transparent. Let's keep that fluidity and that, uh, that, that trust in what we do in the future. Okay, so I'm hearing some important lessons, perhaps even warnings for what we do going forward. And Karen, let's turn over to you now to get your perspective on what you think you've learned just as the business, has, what you've seen so far in this pandemic and where you think we are in this reboot as well. Well, Nancy, first and foremost, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. And I'd like to start by sort of uh, reflecting on what the other panelists said. You know, we are clearly seeing that there's been a huge economic impact because we've seen, uh, you know, economies shrink very, very drastically in the first quarter. India has just uh, announced a 20, almost a 24% shrinkage in its GDP. Even the U.S. has shrunk by 9% and the mm. U.S. has announced a, a GDP uh, shrinkage of 21% and so on and so forth. What's also happened is that all economies have moved from having surpluses to deficits. So I think there is a huge problem we have in terms of investing and in, in back into uh, you know, uh, building our economies. So it is going to be a slow process. And although everyone talks about various alphabets of growth, I think it's going to be a slow recovery. Um, I think for at the moment, I think we must also remember that uh, we don't have good treatments. And I think as uh, Dr. Uh, Chen said, I think we do need to wait for a vaccine because today the trust in a safe vaccine uh, has to be built. I think people want to make sure that even when the vaccine arrives, that it is safe. So I don't think you're likely to see a vaccine for, uh, you know, large use in, in various populations for at least a while. And until then, you will have to deal with treating patients much more efficiently. What I would like to really focus on is the weaknesses and the neglect that pa this pandemic has shown up. I think all of us have realized that our healthcare systems are so fragile. And uh, I think we need to invest in better healthcare systems, right from the US to every part of the world. Probably China ha might have responded much more rapidly. But I think a lot of our uh, economies have been very badly affected with uh, you know, weak healthcare systems. I think uh, Jean Pascal made a very important uh, comment. He said that uh, uh, those parts of the world where it was decentralized and where you know, there was a community effort and inclusive effort dealt with the pandemic much better than a top-down war room kind of an effort, which has not really worked that well. Um, uh, we have all been thrown into the digital world and therefore I do believe that um, this opens up huge opportunities, especially for countries like India. I think India needs to look at rebooting its economy uh, by looking at what the digital economy has to offer or what technology has to offer. I think healthcare has actually taken advantage of a number of these technological opportunities. In fact, one of the uh, you know, aspects of uh, vaccination that is being looked at is how do you uh, use technology to vaccinate our billion plus population in a way that actually can leverage our very unique identification number uh, to see whether we can actually get an extremely powerful database that tells you about who got what vaccine and how many doses did you get. And God forbid, if any vaccine shows some long-term side effects, you can actually know exactly which part of the population is affected and so on and so forth. So I mm. think there are huge unique opportunities using technology. Of course, uh, you know, we are uh, now all getting into a cashless economy, a contactless economy. Uh, and I think things are not going to be the same for the foreseeable future. I think resilience is the name of the game. We need to look at uh, how we use technology for the people not necessarily technology in a, in a smart elitist way, 
So I think that's the inclusive technology focus that yeah. all economies need to look at. And I, for one, have batted on the fact that we do need to strengthen science and technology and innovation in a big way. We do need to strengthen our healthcare mm. systems in a big way. And I think there are lots of opportunities. So I'm very optimistic about bouncing back uh, with and rebooting the economy in a very, very different way. Okay, thank you for that, Karen. And a lot of the themes you're talking about with opportunity and digitalization, I think, Ajay, you touched on as well, but you also hit at this big fear. That's a topic mm. of the Singapore summit, which as this this urge potentially to nationalization and for people to look within their borders. And I'm just wondering if that's already impacting your business. Are you already seeing a material impact? Like I said, this was a trend that existed earlier as well. And I'd my, you know, I have a way of describing uh, protectionism versus precautionism. And let me explain what I mean. To me, uh, precautionism makes a lot of sense. You need to have resilient supply chains for things that could be matters of national security, from medicines to things of that nature. And protecting those in a way that allows you to see and navigate your way through a crisis is probably the mm -hmm. right thing for any government to do. Anybody who argues for global open systems without arguing for good local regulations, that's a fallacious argument. You need to do both because you need to run a global business, but you need to remember that if you're in a global company, you're there in that country at the pleasure of the local country. It's not mm -hmm. your birthright to be operating there. I think I've said this very often, Jean Pascal and I were on a couple of panels together when we've actually talked about this topic, I would say seven, eight, nine years ago. So to me, this is not new, Nancy. How does it impact okay. us? It does because of two things. One is on data and the localization of data. If data is localized for the sake of localizing it to allow domestic businesses to benefit, that's a bad idea because take cybersecurity. It's the nature of the quantum of data that you can process around the world that allows you to find trends in cybersecurity. If you balkanize that, you actually create a challenge for yourself. So there are ways to think about this that are inclusive, that allow for the precautionism, but not the protectionism is the point I'm making. Okay, no, fair enough. That makes a lot of sense. And Dr. Chen, to you, I mean, with your experience, having a better understanding of what the Chinese government may be thinking, I mean, the talk coming from the U.S. side at the moment, especially from the U.S. president, is that he's quite comfortable with this idea of decoupling. Where do you think the Chinese government stands on that? I mean, is that a reality that they're willing to accept the actual decoupling? Shh. Yeah. 真正要彻底脱钩我觉得很困难甚至做不到的百分之九十的企业目前没有要离开中国的打算七月份和八月份还在增加
，整个世界完全脱钩，中美之间完全脱钩，我我个人觉得不可能。如果要那样的话，那就要求。所有世界各国都要选边站队，这对大家也是不利的。所以我觉得脱钩最终不会完全实现的。而谁要脱钩？所以其实用中国的谚语讲，就是搬起石头砸自己的脚，最后会使自己受的伤害比人家更大。谢谢。嗯。And John Pascal, I mean, does the sheer rhetoric around this possibility concern you, though, as a business leader? Yeah, sure. Well, it's a change in the environment to which we must adapt. I, I don't believe personally that there will be a full decoupling. But what I think is that the crisis of the COVID, on the top of other phenomena, is pushing the supply chain, for instance, to be more regional, uh, as we speak mm -hmm. today. Uh, on, on name them. I mean, it's sometimes it's a question of standards as the geographies of the world are developing, they're adopting their own standards. And when you go around the world with your electrical adapter, you know that my industry is not one in the world. It's very different from one place to the other one. And that's an heritage from a long time ago. You see that <laughs> more in digital also, because the world of digital are uh, diverging and therefore our digital world, our system are digital, but they adapt yeah. to the ecosystem. It's about time to market. Our customers want their product faster than ever for yesterday. And you can't do that with long supply chain. Uh, it's about mass customization. They wanted their color, their things, their variants and things. And, and that's great. If you can do that, it's differentiation. It's, it's perfect. It's a lot about sustainability. You can't have a low carbon footprint on long supply chain. So that as this mm -hmm. has been the strategic direction of our company. And I see couples with another thing is that communities, countries are looking for more the balance of what you sell and what they get. So I believe that working with local suppliers, with local integrators, with an ecosystem of partners in a very deep manner is a great guarantee of developing better for the future, adapting faster, mass customers customizing, delivering faster than the other one. So all of this accelerated by the COVID, all of this on the need for resiliency, all of this accelerated by the tensions, but there is something probably more profound uh, behind this regionalization. Okay, so that sounds to me that you're not buying into these fears of a deglobalization. You're still saying it pays to be local in terms of your supply chains and not looking at changes overnight. So that's an interesting point of view to keep in mind there. And Kieran, I just wanted to go back to something you said that was really interesting about the hopes for vaccine development, because that's going to be critical to rebooting the economy around the world, of course. Do you worry that perhaps there's been too much emphasis on speed at the moment and then that, that is eroding trust and could hurt the rollout of the vaccine when it does become available? Yes, I think we do have uh, challenges in terms of getting a vaccine uh, to the people in a very short period of time, uh, because I do believe that uh, some of the recent events that have basically exposed uh, some serious adverse events, which actually happen in most vaccine development programs, mm. uh, has received a lot of uh, uh, attention and of course it does sort of set off uh, alarm bells ringing in people's minds. Of course, this also strengthens the anti-vaxxers view of the vac of vaccine hesitancy that is prevalent in many many parts of the world. And I think you know this is about public trust. So I think we do have to earn public trust. We should not be rushing vaccines into the market without having enough safety data. So I do. Uh, anticipate that there will be emergency use with some strict criteria uh, of how uh, vaccines have to be uh, you know, doled out. But I yeah. think it will take at least a year or year and a half before you really get large populations being vaccinated by a safe vaccine. And I think until then, we do have to cope with the, with the disease. We have to learn to manage the disease better. I have con I have been sort of batting for, uh, you know, focusing on treatment outcomes and lowering mortality rates because that will give you far more confidence than what we have today. Moreover, I think what is also, uh, you know, something I want to talk about is mm. the vaccine nationalism that is creeping into the world. 
you know, many countries want to buy up the first stock of vaccines. And of course, India is in a very strong position because we are the leading vaccine producer in the world. But I think even we realize that we have an obligation to share these vaccine uh, doses with, you know, the, the, the developing world. And I think this actually is very sad that the, the countries don't realize that this is a pandemic that has actually affected the entire world. It doesn't know borders. It doesn't know large, you know, affluent economies. It doesn't differentiate between developing and developed world economies. And therefore, there has to be a concerted global effort to equitably share these vaccines where it's needed. And as I think Pascal uh, or um, Ajay mentioned, that you know, um, the marginalized are the most vulnerable. And therefore, I think we do need to look after their needs in, in, a, in a much more thoughtful manner. And whether it's the economy, whether it's vaccination, uh, whether, you know, whatever we talk about, I think we must understand that by focusing on one and not the other, you are fragmenting the world even further. So I think, although there is this whole sense of nationalism and anti-globalism, let's not forget that the developing world has benefited a lot by globalization. And if you want a resilient economy, you have to get globalization thing back on the table. And I think people have to be less uh, you know, worried about um, the kind of trade wars that they're fighting right now and realize that there is something in it for everyone. Hmm. The question becomes, how do you do that and what kind of participation you need from governments as well to improve the dialogue? Yeah, right now is not the time, time to really, you know, uh, have these debates because there, it, there's too much of um, polarization of thoughts. But I think at the right time when we are over this COVID crisis, I think that's the time to again regroup and think about how to get the whole world economy on a sensible uh, level. <laughs> Oh, fair enough, which raises the question of when do you feel we will be over this crisis? And Ajay, I, I'm curious really for your view that you have in terms of what's happening with the consumer, what's happening with just overall business activity at MasterCard. I mean, how far along do you think we are in this recovery? Uh, we talked about four stages that we would all have to manage the company through, and that was containment, stabilization, normalization, and growth. And containment was the shutdown phase in February and March. And stabilization was the bottoming out that we saw across the world during the month of April. And by the way, these are not linear, to be clear. People go back and forth. Yeah. Singapore had a small incident of going backward. Japan went backward as well. The southern part of the U.S. went backward. So, But containment and stabilization, then normalization was the beginnings of normal activity. You can see consumer spending picking up across the board. What's not picking up are certain mass entertainment activities or mm -hmm. cross-border travel physical travel, those are still deeply impacted. And then growth would be the pre-COVID kind of phase. My view is most countries around the world are somewhere in that normalization phase. And I think the growth phase is gonna require vaccines and trust and cross-border travel to recommence. And we're probably somewhere between six months to a year away from mm -hmm. this actually getting a chance to get back into that stage. Because I think till you get enough vaccines, equitably distributed, available widely enough in a form that people can trust to Kiran's yeah. point. I don't see how you get that feeling back of, uh, of, a, of a growth economy back again. So that's where I'm coming from on this. This, by the way, is true of, of B2B flows as well. There's a lag. They slowed down a little after the consumer spending did. They picked up mm. a little after because of the challenges of restarting supply chains. One of the problems back to digital is that all these supply chains are so paper aligned that it's antiquated in its form and construct, whether it's the, yeah. the yeah. movement of papers or the movement of finance. And in fact, I've just become chair of the International Chamber of Commerce and we've launched our digital standards initiative out of our office in Singapore, in fact, which is looking at how hmm. to digitize and harmonize all these trade flows. And that's the kind of thing we're gonna have to do if we're gonna come out of this the right way. Yes, I mean, it's an interesting topic too, isn't it? Because I'm curious to what extent the amount of government support we've seen 
is helping the recovery along yeah. that you've seen and evidence yeah. in spending. And what happens when it runs out, essentially, when some of the furlough schemes, some of the extraordinary both fiscal and monetary stimulus, if there is that day where it winds down? I mean, how concerned are you about that? Deeply so, but I believe that the that central banks and, and finance ministers have actually done a pretty good job of learning from prior economic crises. Mm -hmm. And they've brought the bazooka to the table when they when other people would have said, can you manage with a rifle shot? And no, they went for this liberalization. I think there is a determination among them to keep this necessarily going till they can see the turn. Fundamentally, first of all, it's a health crisis, but it's impacting lives and livelihoods as well. And so you got to fix the health crisis, keep the economic taps working the right way. And I think most governments around the world get that. I do worry about a, a divide in terms of how long the emerging market can afford to do this in the same way right. as the developed world can. I do worry about the impact on currencies and the like over time. And yes, I worry about asset bubbles. There are lots of things you can worry about, but right now the right thing to do is to shore up the economic system in the mm -hmm. way in which most governments are doing. Uh, Dr. Chen, clearly China has room to maneuver when it comes to providing additional support for the economy. But I wonder how you think the pandemic will change this equation between what is the right amount of government support for industry, because you also don't want to create a moral hazard problem either. And this is something relevant for the entire world where people don't prepare for the next crisis because they assume the government has their back. So how do you balance that? Um, 全世界并没有接受事业的人发工资等等我是打过疫苗的在这现在中国的疫苗已经经过了半年左右后面的问题就是刚刚讨论的尽快的扩大产量企业的正常的关系 yeah. 
恢复生产、恢复市场。那么现在中国国内的市场呢，基本恢复到疫情前差不多的时候，但是国际市场还没有，所以我们非常希望全世界的市场都能尽快的恢复起来。啊，这不仅是对我们，就像对我们赵国华主席的这个法国也好，都希望这样恢复，但是必须要把疫情克制住。让它尽快的消失下去。谢谢。Yeah. Thank you. And we do have some questions coming from the audience. But just before I get to those, Jean Pascal, on that recovery note, I want to get the same thoughts from you that we had from Audrey, which is, where do you think we are in the recovery based on your business activity? Well, I, we see things recovering uh, everywhere. I think the big change that we learned to live with the virus. Uh, now in many places, so with different yeah. precautions, with different ways of doing and being. Actually, I think we shouldn't waste the opportunity to learn how to do many things in a very different manner with much less fatigue, with much less environmental impact. So I wish that not everything goes once there is a vaccine because everything we learn, we, shouldn't, uh, we certainly shouldn't forget it. Uh, on, on otherwise, uh, I, I think we're going to have during some time to live in a very different manner, travel less, travel for longer, if we, uh, if we have and when we have to, uh, get used, we, we start to know better virus, get more through treatments when somebody uh, gets it. So all of this is going through that and not lose track of the real priorities, right? For us, it's yeah. always that behind the virus, which is a warning, there is climate change and California is on fire and uh, Europe yeah. is 15 degrees above the uh, normal average. So there is something brewing, which is probably even more serious in the back. So let's not forget what we, uh, we are experiencing now, that we knew it could happen and we didn't prepare for it. At least yeah. for climate change, we know it's going to happen. It's happening and we know what we have to do. Let's move now on it and let's not wait that we are facing the catastrophes before really uh, putting ourselves in very fast motion yep another good reminder um one of the questions that has come in karen i'll start with you on this one is again about the vulnerabilities in global supply chains i mean what do you think covid 19 exposed in this regard in terms of vulnerabilities and also how can companies better risk manage the global supply chain risks now well, I think, uh, you know, speaking for my industry, where I think, uh, you know, the supply chains were very linked with between, say, extensively with China, I think there were certain concerns about uh, being able to um, fix those, uh, at least uh, hedge some of that risk and start doing multi-sourcing. So I think mm -hmm. supply chains are looking at multi-sourcing uh, and, and being less reliant on just one job, you know, one supplier. I think those kind of things are coming into, into being. And uh, I, I believe that uh, we are going to see some shifting of uh, supply chains. Uh, there is a, a, a kind of a self-reliant kind of a, a rhetoric that many, many countries and economies are chanting, but I think that's going to be short-lived because sometimes it's very inefficient uh, to try and be vertically integrated based on, you know, the kind of supply chains you're part of. So I, for one, believe that uh, there are lots of opportunities for, for a country like India to bring back a lot of manufacturing, which it had surrendered to China. But at the same time, I think India uh, needs to look at its uh, connectivity with many other parts of the world for it to be really efficient. So I, I don't see... Uh, a huge shift in, uh, you know, the sort of the uh, post-COVID world for many of these industries, but there will be some changes. I think there will be some uh, shifting of supply chains in many, many sectors. Okay, thank you. And another question has come in regarding SMEs. Perhaps, Audrey, you can answer this one for us. To the extent that SMEs seem to be have been disproportionately hit hard in this crisis, what are some key measures that are necessary to support SMEs as a, as a further response to other similar black swan events that may be on the cards going forward? Yes, SMEs have been disproportionately impacted, and they are the largest engine of employment growth in any country around yeah. the world. They do constitute 90 plus percent of businesses, half or more or half their employment and 
half or more than half the GDP. It's true for China, it's true for Hong Kong, it's true for the US, it's true for many countries. So I think we all need to pay attention to them. For companies like Jean Pascal's or mine or Kiran's, our supply chains are built on the backbone of SMEs. And so we all need them. My, my, I have three or four specific things we're working on for them, aside from not just MasterCard, but across the system. The first is access to trade finance. I think the trade finance chains have become very challenged given that a number of the banks and institutions are currently somewhat concerned about risk. And therefore, uh, Singapore has made a lot of effort to back up trade finance, and the world needs to mm. step in like we did in prior crisis. The G20 needs to take a role on this. I don't believe that has currently happened in an adequate way. Countries have done stuff on their own, but we need to get cross-border trade finance facilitated. Second, businesses, SMEs, need help to go digital. Everything from getting their inventory to go online to their accounting systems to creating a website to getting digital payments to managing cybersecurity and data analytics. That's another one. A third one in the same place is actually know your customer and KYC and cross-border payments for them. We need digital identities. I think digital identities are the call of the day. They need to be safe, secure, and interoperable. They cannot be isolated into systems. That's another one. Overall, Nancy, I would say uh, the G20 did something very interesting in the prior economic crisis. They created the FSB, the Financial Standards Board. And I've been arguing that such a requirement for data and technology is the order of the day. We need a data and tech board where regulators and opinion leaders, along with the private sector, have an adult transparent conversation about how to create the right railways and the right infrastructure for data and technology for the coming age of digital. And I think we're missing that. We need to get that going. We need standards and regulations to help guide innovation. And take, mm -hmm. take AI and the conversation about ethical users of AI. If you aren't gonna to get to a conversation about how we manage that in a level playing field around the world, can you imagine what kind of balkanization we will have in what could be the single biggest advance on everything from healthcare to SMEs to education to the like. So I, you know, I think it's time for us to take some leadership, if not anywhere else at the G20 level, to focus on these topics. Uh, Dr. Chen, it looks like you may be nodding your head in agreement on that front. I mean, what do you think the biggest impediment is right now to getting more collaboration at that global level? Bindu 没有全球化就没有这么大的生产能力一个国家是不可能抗住的那么现在情况是我们已经经历了这一次的反思了所以每个国家会更多的注意自己的公共卫生产品的生产和储备全球化也发生了一些变化比如说GVC Global Value Chain 这个价值链它会发生变化中国从2008年开始呢 它的组装的产品的出口就开始减少，逐步有一些中间产品出口到印度，出口到越南，然后再有这些国家组装以后，出口到全世界，也包括出口到中国。那下一步中国预算，嗯，价值链还会更加供应链还会更加的短链化。那
Thank you. And I'm conscious of the fact that we are out of time. I just want to give one final question to you, Jean Pascal, which I think is a good way to wrap things up and actually comes in from one of our audience members. That is Tan Shin Hui, who is the APAC CEO at Trafigura. And he's asked if there is one final piece of advice for fellow business leaders during these COVID-19 and trade war events, what would it be? I'd say make choices which are flexible. And, uh, and, and not stick to the schemes of the past, but adapt the scheme so that you can adapt to diverse directions as we go forward. Uh, you can't go against the tide. Uh, you can wish the tide changes direction or changes strengths, but at the end of the day, structure your company maybe with a little bit less optimization, but so that it's resilient, but more so agile to be able to size any kind of direction where the world wants to go. All right, well, perfect way to wrap it up. I do want to thank each and every one of our panelists for joining me tonight. And I think it's been a very interesting discussion, hopefully for our audience members. And thank you to the audience members who have dialed in from all corners of the globe as well. In some cases, waking up early and others staying up late. So I do thank you and to our panelists. Hopefully we meet again in person next year in a new, a new kind of new normal, if you know what I mean. Thank you very much.